Welcome in Big Ten Basketball and Beyond on Selection Sunday. It is truly great to have you with us. Dave Revson and Rafael Davis will head out to Minneapolis in just a bit, get some takeaways on the Illini and that Big Ten championship. But as big as that is, it's Selection Sunday. <laughs> yes. And that is front and center with us. Six Big Ten teams made it. I think we had a sense for several weeks now that was going to be the number. There was obviously a possibility in Minneapolis if we had a team make a run that perhaps they could have gotten there, Ohio State or Iowa. But six felt like the number, and six is the number. Yeah, it's the best Sunday of the year, one of the best days in sports. And I'm here to tell you why I feel as though three of the six Big Ten teams can at least make an Elite Eight run. This mm. should be a phenomenal year for the Big Ten Conference. All right, well, let's run through where everyone ended up. Just kind of bring you up to date on that, and then we'll break down the bracket a little bit. We start with Purdue, the one seed in the Midwest. They'll start with either Montana State or Grambling. Just the third Big Ten team ever to have back-to-back -back one seeds. It is the fifth number one seed in school history for the Boilers. Illinois is a third seed in the East. They get Moorhead State Thursday in Omaha, Nebraska, the Big Ten tourney champ. This is the third time in the last four NCAA tourneys that the Alana have been a top four seed. They'll look to make it out of the first weekend for the first time since 2005. Wisconsin got a five seed in the East. They take on James Madison Friday in Brooklyn, a JMU team that, remember, took down Michigan State to start the year. The Badgers, though, have been great in NCAA tourney openers, winning 12 of their last 14. Nebraska, the eight seed in the South. They will take on Texas A&M on Friday in Memphis. The headline for the Huskers, they have never won an NCAA tourney game, the only power conference school. And I assure you, the matchup with Texas A&M was not done on purpose, <laughs> but it is certainly an interesting one given that athletic director Trev Alberts just left for there. Northwestern is the nine seed in the East. They will play Friday in Brooklyn against Florida Atlantic, a team that made the final four last year, just the third ever appearance for the Cats, their second straight. If they win that one, they would take on Number one seed, UConn. Michigan State got a nine seed in the West. They will play Thursday in Charlotte against Mississippi State. Make it 26 straight NCAA tourneys for the Spartans. It extends the longest streak ever for a Big Ten team. It's the second longest active streak. Only Kansas has a longer one. So, Ray fell lots to digest and, and dissect. And again, we're going to do all of this over the next hour, but just... Big picture as we start off here. Is there anything that surprised you in that grouping of six Big Ten teams? I want to say surprised. If there was one team I had to choose that got a great seed that I didn't think they were going to get, it would be Michigan State. I look at this Michigan State Spartan team and what they, had ahead, what they have ahead of themselves. You can't be nothing but excited if you're a Spartan at home. You think that first game they have to start out with Mississippi State, one of the better defensive teams in the, in the SEC conference. I think if you get a hooked up Tyson Walker, you get a hooked up Malik Hall, I think that can get you through that first game and then you get to that second path you look at UNC you look at RJ Davis the game he just had in North Carolina State against North Carolina State 30 points but on 26 shots I take Tyson Walker AJ Hogarth Jay Nakins in any type of guard game you go to that Alabama game Marcus Sears again I take Tyson Walker over any guards in America as far as one-on-one -on -one matchups these are two teams that can really defend I think that's going to be the challenge for Michigan State is offensively as we kind of talk about what went wrong down the stretch yep. for Michigan State to me it was the offense just wasn't up to snuff so that's going to be the challenge here. But as you say, you kind of look, you, you end up with kind of what you earned. Yep. And for Michigan State, again, maybe you'd rather be in the 7-10 game than in the 8-9 game. And certainly playing North Carolina and Charlotte would be no picnic. But I think right. you look at those games and you say, all right, uh, there's, a, there's a chance. Yeah. Chance to, to make a run here. And certainly no one bets against Tom Izzo in March. That being said, it's probably not the easiest path right, of right, a Big right, Ten right. team. Is there a Big Ten team that you look at and you say, I like the way this lays out. For yeah, I like Purdue's draw, but I really like Illinois' draw. You look at Moorhead State, one of the slower teams in college basketball, and you look at Riley Minix, and then you look at how Terrence Shane and Junior has been defending. If you can stop Riley Minix, you can beat Moorhead State, and then you get to that second game, that's going to be a phenomenal offensive basketball game. If you BYU wins their first game,
game. I'm looking forward to that one. And again, if Illinois decides to defend like they have in the last two second halves of basketball games, I like Illinois definitely getting to that Sweet 16. And then when you get there, you get a pesky Iowa State team, one of the better defenses in the country. They will turn you over, but they can't score the ball. If it's a time where Illinois is making shots from deep, they're getting out in transition. I like Illinois' draw. I like them to get all the way to a Final Four. I think they could beat a UConn team. That is a really interesting matchup were they to get Iowa State, right? It's just strength against strength. The BYU team reminds me a little bit of Nebraska. They're a team that mm. shoots a ton oh, of three-pointers. I think more than 50% of their attempts this year have been from behind the arc. So they're going to shoot threes. Yep. And the, the challenge, obviously, against the Huskers was can you slow them down? They could not slow them down in the first half the other night, but they did slow them down in the second and obviously turned it on as they advanced all the way to the championship game and got themselves a win. And speaking of which, we will get you out to Minneapolis in just a bit. Our crew out there going to react to the Illini and their Big Ten title, plus lots more on the turning draws, including the Badgers, a first-round matchup for them, and more on Terrence Shannon and the Illini as they will look to get out of that first weekend for the first time in nearly two decades. It's Big Ten. Big Ten championship game in Minneapolis playing for that trophy Wisconsin the five seed Illinois the two seed let's pick things up late in the first half Terrence Shannon was just phenomenal the entire weekend drains a three ball there Shannon 102 points in three games in the Big Ten tournament that that's, pretty is, good. Uh, that's an absurd number Stephen Crowell for three Wisconsin taking the lead now up by seven Chucky Hepburn and the foul free throw was good Wisconsin up by 10 the Alana though comeback specialists in this tournament Dane Danger backing down Crowell free throw was good lead down to two a few minutes later Ty Rogers how good has he been on the glass and then Marcus Damask was fantastic caps off a 12 2 run Line I lead up to five. Badgers down three. Max Klesman, this is clutch here, Ray Phelps. Just a big time shot from a big time player. Max Klesman has found his mojo right in time heading into the big dance. Once again, the game is tied, but Shannon responds. Extra pass, three ball. <laughs> Nothing you can do with Terrence Shannon. He's making three. Virtually unstoppable. 34 points one day after scoring 40 and as the final seconds tick down the Illini do indeed celebrate their fourth Big Ten tourney title second in the last four years under coach Brad Underwood. Let's send it to our crew in Minneapolis led by Mike Hall. Well the champ is here the champ is here Brad Underwood Big Ten tournament champion is good enough to join Mike Robbie and I and when you take a, a step back and look at this week you guys had three times you were down double digit points in the second half and came back to win after having never done that the entire regular season. What does that say to you. Well, I didn't like it. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, we were we, we only, I think we had three games all year where we were down double digits one to Valpo. Tennessee and and uh, maybe Purdue uh, real early um, but resiliency uh, we were able to mix and match different lineups it wasn't always TJ and Marcus now they were all huge but like today we had to go big and uh, Dane coming in and, and and sticking Coleman on AJ store was a huge piece it, the other night it was small um, so I, I like our adversity or our, our diversity. I like the fact that we had to play through some things. I hope that prepares you for postseason NCAA tournament wise, but uh, uh, and to do it against three really good teams. Coach Terrence with a record setting performance here in Minneapolis. What was the most impressive thing that, that you saw him do this weekend? I didn't know he had 40 yesterday. I'm not a stat sheet guy during the game. I don't I don't look at it. It, it was so effortless. Uh, we know he's in transition. Uh, and then the other side of that was yesterday, uh, the entire game that every time Casey was in, Tyler, uh, TJ was going to be in. Uh, he was doing it at both ends. We had to make the change today. Chucky got going. We had to slide TJ onto him. So, you know, it was um, uh, not just the points, but it was the defensive side as well. And, and I've said it many times, I think he's one of the great two-way players in the country. Brad, I know that uh, you were disappointed with how you defended in the first half Saturday against Nebraska. 
and I know you were disappointed with how you defended the first minute and change of the second half as well. And the timeout that followed that uh, sequence when Nebraska really had run it up, what happened in that timeout? Because everything since then has been uh, amazing. You did a phenomenal job defensively at the end of that game, and then obviously did a great job today. You know, it, it, it was sometimes silence is golden. And and I had said a lot at halftime. And I mean, you were in the back in the back hall. You probably heard me. Just a little. And uh, but it was more about stopping the momentum of the, at that time. But there wasn't anything I was going to say. And and I had to see if they would respond. And if somebody else would take leadership. I say it all the time. If a coach has to lead all the time during a game, we're not going to be very good. And that all of a sudden that timeout became really positive. It became really energetic. It was Quincy Gurrier. It was Marcus. It was it was Terrence Shannon. And and all of a sudden everybody's chiming in, the guys that weren't playing. So it was on them, much more them than me. And I, I sat there for a minute and a half and, and, and didn't say anything. It wasn't any X and O's that were going to solve our problems at that point and uh, uh, give that group a lot of credit. Last thing for you, you've got Moorhead State, a 314 matchup, but it is on Thursday and you guys just played three in three uh, days. What's your plan the next four days? Well, we're going to enjoy this for another hour until we hit the plane. And I think it's the one thing we learned last time we did that. And, of course, that was completely different being in the bubble. And, um, and you've got to enjoy this. You've got to celebrate this. You've got to, you've got to let that out. Uh, as soon as we get on the plane, I'll start looking at Moorhead. I, I, I've not watched them this year. I don't know much about them. And uh, then we'll, we'll reconvene tomorrow. Hopefully we've got travel plans and we'll... Uh, We'll get uh, where we're going on Tuesday. Now one win at a time, but only six wins to go. Congratulations, Big Ten Tournament champion Brad Underwood. Let's Thank you. Back to Chicago. And there you see the fighting Illini as they were checking out where they are headed for this NCAA tournament. Again, going to Omaha, Nebraska, Moorhead State first up for them. And then if the seeds were to hold, they would take on BYU. Dave Refs and Rafael Davis back with you and it's hard not to focus first on Terrence Shannon Jr. Mm -hmm. I mean the weekend he had was unbelievable. Think about this Ray Fell. You talk about players in the last 28 years to average more than 30 points in a power conference tournament. There have been three. Hmm. Terrence Shannon is one of them. Doug McDermott is one of them and Kevin Durant. Dang. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, it's, like seriously this Bucking is getters. as good a performance yes. again as we've seen on a stage that big at yes. a conference tournament in quite some time, you've got to feel good riding him. And then you got Marcus Damask. Yes. I mean, it is an outstanding one-two punch. Yeah, they got their best players playing their best basketball at the right time of the season. I started with Marcus Damask. He had 26, 8, and 9 in, this ga in the game against Wisconsin. He had almost a triple-double in the game yesterday. So it's a guy that can be the second fiddle to his, to his Batman and be able to score the ball at a high level. They have two guys that can go out and get you 20 given points on any given night. And then Terrence Shannon averaged 34 points a game in the Big Ten tournament. Just Big Ten tournament, just sensational on the offensive end, getting out in transition, figuring it out in the half court, knocking down threes, getting to the free throw line. He was unguardable. If he plays this way offensively in the big dance, Illinois is going to make a deep, deep run. But the most impressive thing about Terrence Shannon over this past week has been his defense. His beast defense has been outstanding. He took the Kese Tomonaga, one of the best scorers in the country, 18 points on 18 shots. You think A.J. Storr from Wisconsin, one of the better sophomores around the country, can put the ball in the basket from three different levels. He gets 24 points, but it took him 20 shots to do it. When you think Riley Minix from Moorhead State, I'm sure Terrence is going to get a piece of that. When he brings it on both ends of the floor, it shows why he's the best two-way player in America. And when you got that caliber guy leading the charge, there's no way you don't make a deep run. Really interested in your take on that matchup with Iowa State. And again, if we've learned anything in the NCAA tournament <laughs> in recent years, it's just because teams are seated somewhere doesn't yes. mean that, that they're going to win. And I understand from an Illinois fan perspective, it's like, hey, Dave, slow your roll. <laughs> right? We haven't gotten out of the first weekend since 2005. Yeah. But let's just say, yep. hypothetically, they get to that matchup with Iowa State. To me, what's intriguing about it is Iowa State is not good defensively. They are Fabulous. Yeah. Like they haven't given up more than 75 That's points crazy. in two months. That's crazy. Right? I mean, they held Houston in the 40s yep. last night. I mean, they absolutely throttled them. 
They're not a good offensive team. Nope. But it is strength against strength. I mean, if we were to get there, to me, it's a fascinating game of Illinois, an absolutely elite offensive team against Iowa State, one of the best defensive teams in the country. Yeah, you think Iowa State, one of the better defenses in the country, they will take your ball from you if you play with it in front of them. And I think of this Illinois team, two guards and Marcus Domask and Terrence Shannon leading the charge, they're going to take care of that basketball. The thing is, if Iowa State can't make shots, if they ricochet shots off of the basket, they don't shoot the ball well from deep, it's going to allow Illinois to get out in transition off of those misses and those bad shots. Terrence Shannon in transition is a problem for any defenses, even the best defense in the country. And they are literally the best defense in the country. They are number one in defensive efficiency. All right, let's turn our focus to the team that they knocked off in the Big Ten tournament. This is Wisconsin seeing their matchup. The South Regional against James Madison Friday in Brooklyn. Chucky Heppard, I don't think he has moved. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Since Let's the, get me to the game. Absolutely. Uh, his coach, Greg Gard, visiting with our crew in Minneapolis. Well, Greg Gard's Wisconsin team sure put up one heck of a fight this week in Minneapolis. Four games in four days and almost came away as the champions. He's good enough to join us now and talk about it. And, Greg, I don't need to tell you, the end of the season was tough for you guys. You were right. struggling in almost every single game. And you played some great basketball against good competition this week. What was different? Well, I think we, you know, February was hard for us, Mike. And I think we started to get back into our swing, the swing of things in early March and getting guys healthy, getting Kamari McGee back after he missed 11 games of the Big Ten season. And, and obviously John Blackwell after he had missed two and a half. Um, we just got back into a rhythm and, and we started playing obviously better and shots go in and uh, I thought we were trending in the right direction before we got here. I thought we had played well against Rutgers. We played well at Purdue a week ago. So we felt we had momentum coming in here and, and I leave today feeling a lot better about, you know, we're, we're better today than we were when we landed on Wednesday. Coach Chucky Hepburn had a fabulous tournament. So much has been made about the fact that he is deferred. Right. But here he found it seemed like the perfect balance of creating for others, but also finding his offense. What was different for him here in Minneapolis? Well, I think he, part of our resurgence has been him. And I tell you, you know, adversity doesn't build character, it reveals it. And through our rougher times in February, his leadership has gone through the roof in a very positive way. I just talked to his dad backstage here and, and just complimented him and, and how much he has grown over the last six weeks and just helping this team and really uh, taking on a vocal leadership role. And it shows when he comes out and plays. I will not ask you the obligatory question about what you know about James Madison because it's not fair, but it is fair to ask you, are you proud of a five seed based on the way February did go and, and what you guys were yeah. able to accomplish since? Yeah, Mike, I think the thing is when you know we've been in this thing, we've been everywhere from a one to a 12, and, and we won when we were a 12. Uh, in, in overtime against Florida State back when Coach Ryan, hopefully future Hall of Famer, uh, was was coaching. But, you know, it doesn't matter. You can really erase those numbers in front of them because every team is good. I always say that all the bad teams are on spring break right now. So James Madison, I know, is really good. I know they beat Michigan State to start the year 31-3, um, and three, and I'll learn a lot more in the next 24 hours. Don't worry, Greg. There's not a long history of 12s beating fives. So it's fine. The, the odds good. are... <laughs> certainly understand. Hey, congratulations on your team really finding their mojo and going into this tournament with a great rhythm and momentum. And again, the five seed in the NCAAs. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, let's head back to Chicago. All right, guys, thanks a lot. So Wisconsin takes on James Madison, as Mike alluded to. The 12-5 can be problematic. I lost in the 12-5. For the five. <laughs> right? he, he's opened up old wounds yes, for Rayfeld there. He even, I mean, he's he's taking a shot at Greg there, and then he's he's uh, he's making you uncomfortable in the studio as well. <laughs> but look, that's the reality of March yes. Madness, and we yep. understand that. James Madison is really good. They actually have the longest winning streak of any team yep. in the country. It seemed to beat Michigan State at the outset of the year. What's the challenge here? I'm looking at Wisconsin's defense. James Madison is a team that averages 84 points a game. They got a guy in Terrence Edwards that can flat out score the basketball. 6'6", six, six, he can make a three, he can drive to the basket. He can straight up score the ball. TJ Bickerstaff is a low down low. But for Wisconsin, I'm looking at Chucky Hepburn. Chucky Hepburn was phenomenal in the Big Ten tournament. He was aggressive offensively, getting to the basket, getting to his mid range, taking open jumpers. And then defensively, he was a pest. If there's a game where he's hooked up, AJ Storr is going, they Got to get Steven Crowder to make some shots. And Tyler Wall, the super senior, he's got to show up in the big dance if Wisconsin wants to win some games. And if they were to win that game, good chance they would take on Duke next. I wouldn't say this is a vintage Duke team. No, I mean, no. I think that this is a team that if they play at their best, Wisconsin absolutely 
could play with. So yep. not out of the question by any stretch of the imagination that we could see them make a solid run. As we continue here on the show, Michigan State got themselves into the dance relatively easily. I think there were some who thought they might be swaying it out, maybe going to Dayton wasn't the case. We'll break down their matchups, plus much more coming up from Minneapolis. We'll hear from Marcus Damask after an amazing run for him and the Fighting Illini. Fighting Illini taking home their fourth ever Big Ten Tourney Championship. Fabulous win. Terrence Shannon just incredible. 34 points. Marcus Damask wasn't too shabby himself against his home state team. 26 points, seven rebounds, and eight assists for the Wisconsin native. He visited with our crew after the victory. Well, at one point in the second half, Illinois was down double digits yet again. But they remembered they had Marcus Damask and they had Terrence Shannon. And Damask is good enough to join us now to talk about it. This is three games in a row. You guys have had huge double digit comebacks in the second half. What has worked so well for you guys late in games this week? Uh, just our fight. You know, no matter, no matter what happens, you know, we come together in timeouts. We all believe in each other. And we're never going to quit. You know, we're going to fight to the end no matter what happens, and, and we were able to get the win. Marcus, I know it was a little bit of a disappointing end of the regular season. Maybe a couple games slip away, but here you guys handle business. Why was this team able to get it done here in Minneapolis? Because, you know, we had, we were a little salty, honestly, about not winning. You know, we let a couple slip that we felt like we should have won, and that just kind of fueled us th for our practices for this week and just heading into this. You know, we, we all had one mission. You know, it was time to string some wins together and get us a ring. Marcus, the portal actually opens tomorrow. So take me back a year ago when you had the decision to make. Why was Illinois the right fit for you at this point in your career and life? Because I had this vision. You know, I had this vision right here with Coach Underwood. I believed that it could come true. I trusted the guys that we had coming back, and, and this is why I came back. The points that you've been able to put up this week are by themselves amazing. Stunningly, you're not the leading scorer on your team. What is it like playing with a guy like Terrence Shannon who continues to just pour in points? Yeah, I mean, he's elite. You know, he he gets out in transition. You can't stop him there. Now, now you get back. Now he's hitting threes and he's driving, drawing fouls. He just, he's so much trouble for defense. and It just opens everything up for everybody else. We, we ran into Grant Hill back in the tunnel yesterday after the halftime speech, and he said it, it took him back to when he played for Coach K, the way he used to talk to him. Could you give us the PG version of maybe the way that Brad Underwood got you guys back on track? Uh, you know, it was it was a lot. You know, he came in screaming, uh, but you know, when, when he gets on us, it, it just it lights something under us, you know. He tries to kind of pick us apart and it really just brings us together because now we all rally together, picking up each other and, and that shows on the court. So as great as this is, there has been uh, not a great history of teams that have won this tournament and then got deeper and deeper into the NCAA tournament. You guys played with a little fire here on the comebacks. In the NCAA tournament, you're gonna be the higher seed, especially early, and then the crowd's gonna get behind that underdog. How do you prevent those slow starts next week? Uh, we just gotta come out ready. You know, I think a lot of times we came out a little sluggish and we waited to the second half to, to really start focusing on the defensive side of the ball and getting stops. So in the tournament, you know, we just gotta have that mindset from the get-go. Marcus Damask, what an incredible addition you have been to this team. Congratulations on the victory, and best of luck heading into the NCAA tournament. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let's head back to Chicago. Guys, thanks a lot. You take a look at Damask and the damage he has done against the home state Badgers. That's just two games, but, man, he has absolutely owned them, including better than 71% behind the arc. He shot nearly 63% from the field overall. Uh, his numbers against the rest of the Big Ten aren't nearly as good, but they're still really good. <laughs> Better than 17 points per game. Really an outstanding season for him after transferring in from Southern Illinois. Uh, Michigan State, we told you earlier, the Spartans are in once again as they will dance for a record 26th straight time, a Big Ten record anyway. Second longest active streak in the nation. Tom Izzo's team actually the highest seeded of the nines. Here's the coach. Well, they're battle tested, you know, and some of the battles we lost. But uh, some of the battles we were right there and we played against a lot of different kinds of teams when I when I think about it. And uh, 
just the uh, the thought of you know a physical game i mean that i mean we just played in a a football game on hardwood so um i'm not you know concerned about that i heard they're very athletic and like i said i know very little about them probably tomorrow or the next day whenever we meet again i'll give you a lot better rundown but right now i'm just i'm just happy we're in i'm happy we have an opportunity to keep playing i'm hoping we can use the experiences we've had to put some things together and uh, see where it takes us. All right, so Tom Izzo, again, you, you're never going to bet against Tom Izzo <laughs> in March, right? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the guy <laughs> knows what he's doing. The 8-9 game is never easy, uh, mainly because of what comes next. Yep. But the committee certainly gave them a ton of respect, Rafael. I mean, again, not just to be a 9 seed when I think there was some thought that they might be a 10, that they might end up in Dayton, but the highest of yep. The nine seats, the best of the nine seats. So, what do you make of how it ended up for Michigan State? Got a really favorable draw, in my opinion. You think Mississippi State going against Michigan State? Michigan State, no matter the season that they had, they still have the number eight most efficient defense in the country. So, if you're a team that's led by one particular score, I don't like you against Michigan State. They have five guys on the floor that could defend at the highest level at all times. When I look at Mississippi State, I see Josh Hubbard, I see Tolo Smith. Josh Hubbard is averaging 17 points a game, which is phenomenal. But he's only shooting 38% from the field. So if this is a game where Josh Hubbard needs 20 shots to get 20 points, I like Michigan State in that game. And you think Tolo Smith, one of the better big men in the SEC, I like him against Malik Hall, Maddie Sissoko, and those guys, one of the best interior defenses in the Big Ten. As we know, Michigan State did not finish the season particularly well. The same could be said of Mississippi State. They yep. lost their last four regular season games. Now it's fair to point out. They were all against NCAA tourney right. teams, and they played well in the SEC tourney. But this is a team that's been up and down, and we saw them play against Northwestern and Rutgers. They, they played really well, beat both of them. They're also a team that's lost to Southern. So, yep. you know, an interesting team, and this is the kind of team that ends up in an 8-9 game. And, again, we'll see where the Spartans can pull it off and perhaps get a matchup with North Carolina. Well, Nebraska just hoping to get that first-ever NCAA tourney win. And, what a fascinating matchup they get based on the events of the last week. We will hear from Fred Hoiberg. Plus, some coaching news is Jake Giebler now in charge at Ohio State on a permanent basis. We will get you the details on that as we continue on Beyond. The Nebraska Cornhuskers are dancing at eight seed in the South. They will take on Texas A&M. On Friday in Memphis, they end a 10-year NCAA tourney drought, and now will shoot to win a tourney game for the first time, the only power conference school that has not done so. Fred Hoiberg talking about watching the brackets unfold. It's just how it's just how I've kind of done it, Amy. I uh, you know I get nervous. Um, you know I have a heart condition, and you know it pounds pretty hard when I'm sitting in there. And you know I just uh, I just you know wanted to be in there and kind of savor the moment and you know the guys were down there they were celebrating I love it I love that those guys got to do that as a group and you know we got a lot of uh, you know tough times ahead of us now to get ready for this game but you know it's it was a good day you know not to have anything I, I went back and watched our game and then there was nothing to do there was no prep and just kind of you know had a lot of thought a lot of reflection about where things are right now and, uh, you know, tonight, as soon as I get out of here, you know, I should have some games on my computer and I'm going to dive in and, and try to help put a game plan together with our assistant coaches and, you know, try to put something to give us the best chance uh, to win this game again against a great team. Well, it's a pretty cool story. And we have talked a lot during the course of the year. I mean, Nebraska is built in such a way yep. that you can win NCAA tournament games. I yep. mean, three-point shooting teams, they're a team that's versatile. There's about eight different players lead them in scoring this year. Texas A&M is tough, as we know. Buzz Williams, the Trev Albert storyline is, <laughs> is frankly unbelievable. Yep. But it is what it is. And then the possibility of, of playing Houston, one of the best defensive teams in the country. But, you know, again, this is kind of what you get when you're in an 8-9 game. Man, you look at how Texas A&M wins basketball games. It's their defense and it's their offense, their rebounding ability. And you look at Nebraska, one of their toughest teams in college basketball. They rebound the basketball on the defensive end at a very high rate. So I don't worry about Texas A&M offensive rebounding abilities. I just look at Nebraska and I say, who do you scheme for? Do you scheme for Kase Tominaga? Do you scheme for Rink Mask or Bryce Williams? Because any one of those guys can beat you. If you try to throw a load on um, Rink Mask in the post, 
KJ Tominaga starts making shots from deep. Bryce Williams is going. That's when you get a 51-point first half like they had against Illinois. If they can continue to put two halves together offensively to go along with what they do defensively, I like Nebraska in this game. They're one of the tougher teams, and you can't really size up the toughness of Jawan Gary and Josiah Alec through film tape. The challenge against Texas A&M is twofold. As you said, it is keeping them off the glass. I mean, yep. their offensive rebounding numbers are absurd, 42% of That's their crazy. misses. They rebound. Now, they miss a ton of shots. Yes. They're a terrible shooting team. Yes. One of the worst in the country. But, man, they're really good defensively. And then, you know, can you keep them off the glass? And, and then, again, if you get Houston, all right. Just see what happens. Yeah, uh, you take your chances for that, and you – you see where it takes you, right? Uh, there was coaching news, as we told you. Uh, Jake Diebler is the full-time head coach now at Ohio State as the school made the announcement on Sunday. He was named the interim coach in mid-February after the dismissal of Chris Holtman. Led the Bucks to six wins in eight games, including a shocking upset of number two Purdue in his first game. He's had two different stints on the Buckeyes staff, serving under both Holtman and Thad Mata. 38 years old, youngest coach in the Big Ten, so he supplants Ben Johnson there <laughs> in the youngest coach. Yeah. I, I don't want to say I'm surprised, but I guess I kind of am. I mean, I just it, it, it's just hard to know kind of what would be the approach here. Mm -hmm. But certainly the job that Jake Diebler did, yep. it's obvious that the players really like him. To me, it's a really smart choice to continue the momentum here that you built in the last month. I love the decision. I saw Ohio State beat Purdue, go on to beat Michigan State, and I started asking the question, why wouldn't he be in a running? You can see that the players love to play for Coach Diebler, the mindset they have under him. A player I look at specifically is Jamison Battle. I love Jamison Battle, but at times he looks like he's floating on the perimeter. He's shooting a bunch of threes. It looks like he cares about his points. The way he's played over the last two, three weeks has been nothing short of amazing. He's driving the basketball. He's rebounding offensively. He's guarding on the defensive end. You get these guys to buy in at the end of the season after the season they had, that was big time, and he's a great recruiter. Well, that is uh, apparent, right? Yeah. And, and it's apparent that he has a connection with the guys. I think the unknown for me was just Ross Bjork, and, yep. and he's a guy who's been known as an athletic director for making kind of high-profile hires. Yep. This is not a splashy high-profile hire. I think what it is is probably the really smart hire. Yes. And we'll see where it goes. But, uh, but again, it, it's kind of akin to what Northwestern did with David Braun. you got a guy right yeah. there who the players like and, and have responded to. And, again, congratulations to Jake, who is a tremendous, tremendous guy. Lots more to come as we continue here. We'll dive into the Purdue Boilermakers. This is when the redemption tour begins. Purdue, a number one seed again. Can they take it all the way to the final four? And the Northwestern Wildcats into back-to-back -back NCAA tourneys for the first time in school history. We'll break down their first matchup against Florida Atlantic. Plus, back out to our crew in Minneapolis. Lots more on the Illini win over the Badgers. Illinois, the Big Ten Tournament champs. Pause for the facts. Susie here is shopping for a used car, but she doesn't know that nearly half of them have been in an accident. Interesting. But Carfax.com shows how accidents impact price, so she doesn't have to overpay. Unpause. Shop the all-new Carfax.com. With Rayo's made-for-home brick oven crust pizza, delicious is finally in the frozen pizza aisle. We start with Rayo's iconic sauce, then pile on all the best toppings, so your backup plan becomes a night you plan for. In pizza we crust. In celebration of Women's History Month, throughout March, the Big Ten Network will profile inspiring athletes, recognizing their accomplishments and impact, both on and off the field. Shopify helps you sell at every stage of your business. Like that ready to launch stage, that open for business stage, that sell it everywhere until you sell out stage. That count it up, ship it out stage. And that, wait, did we just hit a million orders stage? Whatever the stage, businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. July 13th, the BTN Big 10K returns to Soldier Field in Chicago. Runners can choose between a 10K or 5K option, followed by an unforgettable tailgate party. 
featuring mascots, cheerleaders, food, and more. All participants receive a school-specific T-shirt and Big Ten medal. And if you can't make it to Chicago, you can still represent your school and participate virtually wherever you live. Register at btnbig10k.com or scan the QR code right now. Have you ever helped a fellow veteran? Of course. Yes. Have you ever asked for help yourself? Uh, it's always tough, right? I always feel like I can solve my own problems, but eventually, you know, you just can't deal with it on your own. And you start to question, maybe people would be better off without me. When you realize that you're not alone, once you take that first step, there's so much support. Illinois, your Big Ten tournament champs for the fourth time in school history, the third most of any school. So second in the last four years prior to that, they had not won it since 2005. Terrence Shannon Jr., Marcus Damask, the stars in this one as the Illini go home with the trophy. We go back to Minneapolis and our crew led by Mike Hall. Well, they certainly put the wow in Oski Wow Wow. Illinois is your Big Ten Tournament champions. Hall of Famer Mike DeCourcy, Andy Katz, Robbie Hummel, and Mike Hall here with you. Guys, we could spend this entire segment talking Terrence Shannon scoring 102 points over the weekend. All-time tournament record on Saturday. Championship record game on Sunday. But how about what happened when the game was tied at 85? Klesman hits a three to tie it. An immediate three from Shannon. The next possession he gets a steal. The next two possessions he gets three free throws. It changed the end of the game. Oh, it really did. They locked down those last minute 57. And it's so ironic because we've talked the entire weekend about how Illinois has got to be more consistent, more disciplined on the defensive end of the floor. And that's what we saw. I mean, A.J. Storr had it going. Chucky Hepburn had it going. They shut the water off. And as great as Terrence Shannon was, they don't win the game if they don't guard. But they guarded that last two. And I will tell you, an unsung sort of hero for Illinois this entire week was Dane Danger. And yes. look, I'm not coaching here, but I would say that I'd be shocked if Dane Danger does not have more of a role in the NCAA tournament. He certainly proved it, he earned it, and he was a major factor to Illinois winning this championship. You're gonna have to take my word for it on this, but I swear I was gonna talk about pace in the pregame show, and we just didn't have enough time. Illinois is one of the fastest teams in the country, top 15% in terms of pace, and Wisconsin is not, they just play a different way. Both of the games in this series this season, the winner got more than 90. At the end of the game, in the final four minutes, Wisconsin got going too quickly. A.J. Storr got a shot in the lane. It wasn't a bad shot, but it wasn't the right shot. And the same thing for a Chucky Hepper and layup attempt. They weren't the kind of quality shots that they had been getting earlier, and they missed them both, and that cost them. Can I just add one quick thing? This is back-to-back -back Sundays I saw Wisconsin lose. I felt great about the Badgers after seeing them lose at Purdue. You were there as well. And I feel the same way now. I think they could go on a nice little run and win a bunch of games in March after what we just saw. You saw it too. No, I, I totally agree with you. And just the last thing that I'm going to add here is that Marcus Damas not making the all-tournament team is probably not correct. <laughs> 26 <laughs> points, was really good in the semifinal. He was fabulous alongside Terrence Shannon. It is interesting. You said at the beginning before the game about consistency. I Illinois had been turning it on. They hadn't been consistent. They really weren't consistent no. in this game but they got away with it again yeah they, they, they found a way they went through adversity I mean, I mean they they had I would say halves of basketball here where they didn't play well but at the end of the day it's about finding a way and this senior laden team did just that they found a way to win today and they are our Big Ten tournament champions Robbie you'll have to take my word for it but I voted for Marcus I swear <laughs> I, I, I believe you I believe you <laughs> it is the fourth Big Ten tournament title all time for Illinois and interestingly enough of the 26 champions now 19 of them have been either a one or a two seed. Let's head back to Chicago. Purdue was, of course, the one seed in the Big Ten tourney. They're a one seed in the NCAA tourney as well, Mike, as we have expected for quite some time. Second straight year, they'll be a one seed. They're just the third Big Ten team ever to do that. Back to back one seeds. Michigan State did it 99 to 2000. Ohio State 91 92. And now Purdue. You see the path ahead here for the Boilers, starting with the winner of Montana State and Grambling State. Telly Hughes in West Lafayette catching up with the Boilers. Okay, thanks, Braden. First and foremost, how are you feeling, and will you be ready to go come Friday? Yeah, no, we're all super excited. Um, it's an unbelievable opportunity and super fun event to be a part of, and I'm feeling all good, ready to go. 
Now, talk about the feeling of starting this journey just 60 miles up the road and being able to play pretty much in front of your home fans. Yeah, no, it's it's awesome. I mean, we've played at, in Indy uh, two times back to back years. So, I mean, it was an unbelievable turnout, um, basically a home crowd for us. So I'm looking forward for that. This is a group that has had to sit on that first round knockout for a whole calendar year. What makes this group equipped and prepared to change the results this time around? Yeah, I mean, just putting in the work this summer. Um, we all had to deal with everything that went on. So just looking forward to that and seeing everything that we put th we've been through and that we've the, the work that we put in um, to get us there. You were a part of the group that was on the team that was knocked out in the first round last year. You had to sit on this for an entire calendar year. How excited to finally go through the full season and get to this point? And do you feel like this group is prepared to have a different outcome? Absolutely. You know, the time is here. You know, we got about a week left to prepare. And whenever we've sat with this feeling all year, every single game we kind of talk about it. You know, that's our motivation all year. And we don't necessarily let the media like pull us down or bring us up, but we hear what they say and we use it as fuel. That's our biggest thing all year is to use what happened last year to learn from it, move on from it, get better from it. And I think we have, you know, we still have to prove that, no doubt, but I think we have gotten better and I think that it'll show throughout the tournament. Well, we all know the narrative with Purdue. It's not just last year. It's the last three times they made the NCAA tourney. They've lost to a double-digit seed each time. They've got the National Player of the Year. He was National Player of the Year last year. He's almost certainly going to be National Player of the Year again this year in Zach Eady. Everyone is trying to figure out how to stop him. <laughs> what did you see from Wisconsin here yesterday that you think might help whoever's preparing for Purdue. They switched it up. And then when they were digging, they were digging. If they were scraping, they were scraping. They knew exactly what they were doing, scouting report wise, when it came to guarding Zach Eady. And then they forced everyone else to beat him. Zach Eady scored 28 points or 7 of 11 from the field. They took his basketball a few times. They came at him. And then they just forced other guys to make plays. You see John Blackwell coming over, taking away Zach Eady, being a disruptor, leaving Cam Heidi wide open. This is going to have to be a tournament where other guys make plays. You see Gilmore sitting in Zach Eady's lap, just leaving Mason Gillis wide open. This has got to be a game where guys on the perimeter have to make shots. You think Fletcher Lawyer against Wisconsin. Nine points, one to four from the field. Lance Jones, nine points, four. 10 from the field and then even Brandon Smith no he was a little bit hurt but seven points three of ten those three guards they've got to be productive they can't allow teams to double team and send a kitchen sink at Zach Eady they got to make some shots this is the biggest thing that concerned me this weekend not that they lost but the right. fact that you had Lance Jones score 10 points yep. in one game and then no one else scored double figures and then yesterday no one else scored yeah. double figures right? no I agree so that, that, to me, is the concern. Yep. If you're going to say, let Zach Eady get his and make those others beat us, this weekend the others didn't beat him. Yep. So we'll see. Again, a favorable draw, not only in Indy, but also in Detroit. So uh, a, a real hometown uh, path here for the Boilermakers. Northwestern is dancing again. The second straight year the Wildcats have made it third time in the last seven years for Chris Collins and company. Northwestern will head to Brooklyn where they will take on Florida Atlantic on Friday and then likely take on UConn on Sunday. Were they to win? Of course, they've won their first game. Both times they've been previously to the dance. Here's what Chris Collins had to say after learning of the Wildcats' destination. It's exciting to, to be back in, in March Madness and the NCAA tournament. Um, it was great to be in the first bracket because it's uh, it is very nerve-wracking uh, I think we're all we were confident we were going to be in but there was a lot of craziness uh, the last couple of days that kind of threw everything into chaos but um, our guys we got what we deserved I mean we are an NCAA tournament team um, we're excited about the opportunity uh, to go to New York City uh, Brooklyn um, I know there's a lot of Northwestern alums and, and people in that area and um, you know playing against a team that went to the final four last year and we'll do a deep dive. You know, I've, I've studied them from afar, and the job Dusty's done with, with Florida Atlantic uh, these last two years has been awesome, and, and, and we'll get to work and, and be, be ready to roll on Friday, you know, whenever we play. So just really excited, excited for our program, but most excited for our, our players.
Among those players, Boo Booey, I'm assuming at some point Boo got to say something. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, maybe he was just <laughs> smiling and nodding along the way. Uh, there's the matchup, FAU in Brooklyn, and then either UConn or Stetson. I, I like the Huskies' chances against the Hatters. But let's talk first about FAU. And, again, this is a Final Four team from a year ago. They're really good offensively. You've got a seven-footer in Vladislav Golden. Matthew Nicholson rolled out on a scooter today. I mean, he clearly isn't playing in the NCAA tournament. You have John L. Davis as well. This is a dynamic duo here, and it's going to be tough to defend them inside. For you need West. Preston and Hunger to have their best game defensively and at least give you a double-double offensively. But big game Boo is headed to the Big Apple. I expect Boo Booey to have a phenomenal performance. Going up against John L. Davis, an Indiana native. I've known him a long time. He's averaging 18 points a game. That's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. If it's close at the end of that game, I'm taking Boo Booey every day of the week. Northwestern, not a, a great offensive team here recently. They were fabulous at the beginning of the year. It's a shame because FAU struggles yes. on defense. You think about how Northwestern was originally constructed. This would have been a great matchup for them. We will see how it goes. The dramatic conclusion of our show coming up next. Final thoughts on the six Big Ten teams that are headed to the big dance as we wrap things up on Beyond. Six Big Ten teams are dancing. We got three teams, top five seeds, three teams in the 8-9 game. Purdue, Illinois, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Michigan State, and Northwestern all headed to the NCAA tournament. We're headed back to Minneapolis. Get some thoughts on the bracket from our crew there. Well, thanks, Mike and Robbie, joining me as we get our chance to look at the bracket and digest it. And I think the, the biggest story that any casual Big Ten fan is curious about is Purdue. With what happened last year, losing in the 116, they're a one seed again this year. What do you think about their path? Well, first off, they're, they're going to be happy about their location. You've got your first week in Indianapolis. Your second would be in Detroit. You look at that 8-9 game, you're getting a Mountain West team in Utah State. The Mountain West, really one of the pleasant surprises, I think, in college basketball this, this year from a mid-major perspective. And then you look at TCU, a battle-tested team out of the Big 12. TCU, very athletic. But I, I do think that Purdue would look at those two teams and think we've got a great chance. The four fives are very favorable to Purdue. Kansas, a team that's banged up. Question marks around Kevin McCullough. Question marks around Hunter Dickinson. And, and then a Gonzaga team that I would assume that you would say is a surprise at where they're seated. Um, but Purdue's already, already beat them in Maui. I think that Purdue would feel very good about their chance to make a deep run with who they've got. Is there a chance the Illini have final four dreams. Well, I think you can absolutely believe you have the possibility, but you are in this, the region with the most complete team in college basketball. Best, worst, uh, but most complete. They have everything you need to win a national championship, UConn does, and that's difficult to contend with, but obviously first they have to get through their Moorhead State game and then a potential matchup with BYU in the second round. BYU is a very dynamic offensive team, not a great defensive team, so that, that's a game to watch. That's one to circle. That's going to be one of those games that really goes. It was interesting. There are three Big Ten teams that are playing in the dreaded 8-9 matchups. I'm curious your thoughts on any of those. Well, I think it, it's very interesting to see what Northwestern does, how healthy they are. They, they, they'll they have a few extra days now because they lost in the in the quarterfinals to get healthier. They're not going to have their big man uh, more than likely in Matthew Nicholson. Uh, so they are the team that we saw at the end. And it's a different, you know, it's a different team, but it's an effective team. I've got my eye on the Nebraska-Texas a and game. The Cornhuskers just saw Illinois on this floor, and Illinois can rebound. A&M can really rebound. You've, they're going to have to block out. It's going to be a battle on the boards. There's an outside chance Trev Alberts will be watching that game, Nebraska <laughs> yeah. and Texas A&M. Also interesting to keep in mind with Wisconsin, their opponent, again, it's a 5-12. It's also James Madison, who the first game of the season took down a Big Ten team in Michigan State. I think we should watch these games the next few weeks. You guys sound good? Think, okay. I think, yeah, you don't get to watch. You have to call them. That'll do it for us. Let's head back to Chicago. I hope he's watching him while he's calling him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be that would add an extra degree of difficulty. Yeah. Uh, your final thoughts on what we saw. I love Purdue's draw at this point in the season. Everyone in the country is saying, if it's not Final Four, it's a bust for Purdue. 
but I love Tom Izzo as well. And it's all about Spartan magic in March. Tom Izzo, I think they beat Michigan, Mississippi State. I think they can beat a UNC. I think they can beat an Alabama. I think Michigan State can make one of those patented runs in March. Will someone cut down a net and make it to the Final Four? It was Illinois cutting down nets on Sunday. Hey, we'll see you an hour from now as we run through not just the rest of the men's tourney, but the women's as well.